Ted's a uh, non-profit for the ideas worth spreading. It started in 1984 as a conference bringing together people from three worlds, technology, entertainment, and design. And since then, the scopes have come up broader. Along with two annual conferences, the Ted Conference on the West Coast in the spring, Ted Global, and then in the summer. Ted includes the award-winning Ted Talks video site, uh, open translation project, Ted Conversations, uh, Ted Fellows, TEDx, and the end of the Ted Project. What we're doing today is the TEDx program. It's basically small, independently organized um, focus group where we have a couple of speakers come in and uh, kind of concentrate on one idea. And our idea is sustainability. And each of the four speakers um, that are addressing you guys today will we'll hit on a specific area of that. Uh, hopefully by the end of the day, you guys, your families, your teachers, and your so we'll, we'll be able to engage like, ideally in critical conversations about why it's so crucially important to address sustainability and ever expanding global society, and that's what you're starting to talk about population. Um, so quickly, <laughs> Chuck Stearns taught at Conroe for 23 years, and uh, was recently educated at Northwestern University. I, I would say that few people embody what we call lifelong learners as much as Mr. Stern does. Um, he's constantly traveling, he's taking classes, he's speaking to students of all ages, he's passing for geography and everything that falls in that blanket really is unparalleled. Um, he currently teaches sixth grade in AP Human Geography, and in the summer he reads for the college for AP Human Geography. So, I'm going to I'm going to take my glasses off so I can't see. I'm going to hire him for my press agent. Um, a couple of you people have seen this already, uh, a couple of the things that I do to talk about population. The other speakers this morning have talked about sustainability in other areas, but I always tie it back to population. Um, back about 1800, there was an economist in England named Thomas Melvis, and his theorem was that, uh, that population keeps growing geometrically, like 2, 4, 8, 16, look, one over here, 32, 61, I can't do one over here, okay, and that, and that resources, like acres of land that we plowed or cut down the trees or something, grow arithmetically, kind of slowly, this one I can do, one, two, three, four, and you can see what happens at the end of that. You know, he predicted that at some point in time that this is all the supplies that we get right here. This is it. This is our suitcase. And we're not getting any more FedEx shipments from the moon or from Mars or from under the ocean or anything else. Whatever we got, it's right here. And we've got to make do with this. And back in 1800, when he came up with that theorem, it's called the Malthusian theorem, um, there were one billion people on the Earth. Who knows how many people there are now? Seven. Just over seven billion, right. So in the last 213 years, we have added six point something billion people to the earth. And I'm going to show you two ways today. I've got two kind of favorite ways of doing that. One is called the Stork and the Grim Reaper, and the other one is called World Population. I think I'll do the World Population first. Let me tell you how I got into this first. About 10 years ago, this organization called Population Connection uh, invited me to come and, and learn how to train other people about population issues and also resource issues. And having nothing to do for a week that summer, I said, yeah, I'll go. Mm -hmm. A week in Washington, D.C., they're paying the bill. Come on, that's a no-brainer. And uh, I learned a lot from them. And one of my favorite things that I learned was this video. And I'm cheating because we found it on YouTube, too. Um, it's called World Population. And it's one of, uh, I think, one of the best ways of teaching using the fewest words. An environment is a system of living things.
environment to provide space, to produce food, and to supply energy are all limited. Humans thrive on less than 17% of the Earth's surface. Only about 4% will grow crops. We depend on these limited resources for our survival, and yet we're increasing our population as if they were infinite. This fact is at the core of our environmental problems. On this map, we'll show population growth from the year 1 AD to present, and then project our growth into the year 2030. Population concentrations will be indicated by dots, each of which will represent one million people. In areas where people are spread out and don't live in concentrations of one million, dots are placed in the middle of their approximate range. As some areas become superpopulated, dots will spread outward in order to show the total population within the map. Historical references will be provided by images and text on the lower right. Present growth rates continue, our population will double in about 50 years, yet the Earth's size remains the same. 
slowing human population growth and lowering our consumption of natural resources is key to reducing the impact we have on our planet. Through our personal decisions about our numbers and our lifestyles, each of us can help to preserve the health and beauty of our home. Let's see how well you are This is it. This is all we get. How long till the population doubles from what it is right now? 50 years. Okay. And what were the two things that we can do to sustain life on Earth? What are the two possible things that we can do? And this morning you talked about one of them, sustainability. We can conserve our resources somehow. And the other one? Yeah, decreased population growth, or at least being cognizant about our numbers on the Earth. Um, I have a favorite theory. Uh, Frank, do you remember the bicycle theory? Stearns? <laughs> You're my plan. I was paying you to say yes. I guess. Um, I've got a, a theory called the bicycle theory. It seems to be that in most of the countries on the earth, uh, and a good many of them happen to be in Africa, in a good many of the countries that have high population growth rates and big families, total fertility rate, all those numbers are really high, they can't afford it. They can't afford to have big families. But they need to because they have high infant mortality and they have agricultural lifestyle, so they need kids to work on the farm. And the countries like Western Europe and the United States and Japan, the countries that can afford to have large families, don't, do we? We tend to have 2.1 children in the United States per family. And that's a rate that'll keep us going exactly on the level, not counting immigration, things like that. Um, so my theory, the bicycle theory, is that you all are going to make decisions in your life how big you want your family to be. And whatever resources you have, just like the resources of the earth, whatever resources your family has, income and so forth, that's it. That's all you get. So you can divide it among two children or 20 children. And if you divide it among 20 children, everybody doesn't get a bike. But if you divide it among two children, you can afford a bicycle for everybody. Stern's bicycle here. I'm not sure if it works or not. Um, I need uh, two volunteers. For, uh, let me let me try to get someone from another school other than Pinewood. I need two volunteers. It won't hurt. I promise you. Put somebody's hand up if they're next to you. Come on up. Come on up. Come on, Mary Bell. It won't hurt. Come on. <laughs> we are going to do. <laughs> I have I have my two volunteers, um, and we're going to do something called the Stork and the Grim Reaper. And all of you are familiar with the Stork, of course, does what? Babies, babies, right? So if you didn't learn this in biology class, Ms. Cusack, uh, that's where babies come from, from the store. And the other one, of course, you're familiar with the symbol of the Grim Reaper. So... I'm in the store. Yeah, we're going to stick You got it? Grim Reaper. <laughs> now, this right here is the Earth. And you notice it's not full yet. Okay? This is people inside the Earth. And if it doubles within the next 50 years, that's cool. We've got room, we've got equipment, we've got our suitcase, and we've got enough stuff probably for everybody. Um, we may have to pull in a little bit in our wants and our needs, but this is the Earth and this is the population of the Earth. What happens when we get overpopulated? Yeah, we don't have enough stuff. We don't have enough food. We don't have enough space. Uh, by the way, all the people in the world would fit inside Texas. If you brought everybody to Texas, there'd be room for them to live in Texas. They'd be a little bit proud of it, but they could live in Texas. But what don't you have there? Resources. Resources, yeah, you don't have space, you don't have water, you don't have energy, you don't have food and so forth, and you need all of those things. So if we get overpopulated, and I have no clue what that number is, but if you get overpopulated, you've passed the sustainable level and then, I don't know what you're going to do, 
and you're like <coughs> some people that are on the earth right now who don't have enough stuff wherever they are and wish they were in Texas. This, by the way, is called <coughs> Great Beyond. And to stay out of theological discussions, the Great Beyond is where babies come from, it's where souls go when they're done living on this earth and so forth. And uh, the stork and the Grim Reaper here are going to Stork, you're going to again, put that around your neck, okay, because you're going to be busy. That's uh, upside down, because everybody always asks me that. Gets a touch. And, um, Grim Reaper? <laughs> um, the birth rate and the death rate are how many people per thousand in any given country are born or die every year. And if the birth rate and the death rate were the same size, what would happen? No population would continue to stay the same. But worldwide, now in the United States, that's the case. In Europe, the population is generally declining a little bit. They're having smaller families and uh, the populations are declining. That's got some other bad effects too. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the birth rate worldwide is three times the death rate. So who gets which one? You get okay. And what I'd like you to do is, I'd like you to dip one, Sam, come over here on this side, and you will dip one cup of babies onto the earth. <laughs> told you this would be painless. Okay, you don't have to do it fast. No splashing, it's Kool Aid. And. Okay, and you just keep up with each other. Go ahead. I had these students in sixth grade. They argue all the time. Um, you can kind of get what's happening here, too. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Bad choices. <laughs> we talked a minute ago about we talked a minute ago about some countries, especially in Europe uh, and Russia as well. Uh, the birth rate is getting smaller, and the death rate is staying about the same. So the population is declining. Are there any problems with that? Help me out. Okay. Any problems with a population that's declining, get smaller? Well, also, people would get older too, don't they? So, and we have that problem in the United States too. I happen to be part of a group of people called the Baby Boom, right? And uh, so we're getting, I dyed my hair gray for this presentation today, um, we're getting a graying population. And in fact, I think Stone and Kinell are here today, too. Um, so we're, our population is gradually getting older. Any problems with that? Yeah, there are problems. Because, Max, you're going to be supporting me someday when I retire and go out on Social Security. And you're in that middle group of people, not the young people. They're not working yet. Not the old people. They're retired. But the working population in the middle. And that's getting smaller. And the old folks, like Mr. Kinell, that's getting larger. How are we doing, ladies? Stop. Okay. Good. Okay. So, what conclusion can you make from this? <laughs> so, what do we have to do? Well, we have to got to make this bigger, and we already said that we can't do that. It's what it is. And that's all of our supplies. Um, or we've got to somehow address this population problem. And especially maybe in places that, that people are less developed, less developed countries, um, the more developed countries that can afford to have lots of babies are not having them. And the less developed countries are having them. Can I have a round of applause for the... Um, yeah, every year, raise your hand, Germans. <laughs> I knew you'd come, Germans. 
Um, we add every year to the world's population, the population of Germany, which is about 80 million people. Every year we're adding that right now. And I'm not being a the sky is falling type person. I'm just saying that we need to be aware of population issues. We need to be aware of resource issues. We need to maybe wean ourselves from gas engines. When your children are born, they're not going to be driving cars as you and I know them right now. They're going to be doing something else. And guess who's going to have to decide and design the something else? It's going to be you guys, right? Learning it in Mr. Bryce's robotics class or something like that. So, you know, I'm passing the torch to you. You somehow have to get us out of this quandary that we're in right now. Last thing I want to do, what well, lamp school today, this is another way of kind of showing population issues and, and the earth and the earth's resources and so forth. And a friend of mine in the public school pointed out to me one time that she could never do this in her class. How come? Public school, you can't bring knives to school again. But, but we haven't done that right <laughs> Right. Need your help. One quarter, three quarters. There's a little bit of math in this too. So what's the three quarters? Seventy-five percent. Seventy-five percent. But if this is the Earth, what does this water. represent? Water. Yeah, this is the world's ocean. We haven't learned how to live in water yet, and we haven't learned how to live without water yet. And this represents what? Land. Okay. But all of this land, this colored stuff on this globe. You can't live on all of it, can you? Nope. You, for instance, you can't live very well right here because of what's there? Desert. 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 Yeah. And you can't live right here because it's too cold. Too cold. Yeah. And, and sometimes my sixth graders say, that's okay because by the time I'm grown up, we can take a rocket ship to the moon or to Mars or something like that. What's wrong with that answer? Too expensive, yeah. That ticket is going to be very, very expensive. It would be a lot cheaper to conserve our resources and live on Europe. But since I can't live on every bit of this land, I'm going to take this quarter of an apple and cut it in half. And this is how much? I had a quarter. This is a quarter. One eighth. Okay. And one eighth of the Earth's surface, you can't live on, even though it's land because it's too hot, it's too rocky, it's too high, it's too cold, and something like that. So we can live on this proportion of the Earth's surface. But guess what? We can't live on all of that either because some of it, I cut the eighth into four pieces, so what do I have? Right. Got one thirty second, one thirty second, one thirty second, one thirty second. This 30 second is too dry, or you can't grow food on it. Okay? This 30 second is someplace that we've already developed, like right here. This used to be a farm that you're standing on right now. Um, this 30 second, we can't live on that either because something else is already there, or it's put aside as a national park, or it's a rainforest and it's not hospitable to us. And this is the part that we can grow food on to feed this whole hundred percent just one thirty second of the earth's surface is arable can grow crops can grow food for us and the bottom line is that we can't even depend on all of that because just sliced off the earth's surface because what do we depend on we don't depend on the inside of the earth do we we depend on the stuff that's on the surface like our topsoil Okay, and there's, there's only a couple inches of topsoil up here. And that's got to grow. This little piece, this little slice of the peeling has got to grow all the food for all of those 7.3 billion people. And we've got to take care of that, too. Our erosion rate in the United States is three times what it is in China and India. How come? We don't get down on our knees with a, with a hoe and till our soil intensive agriculture like they do in some other countries that really need the food. We send out our big John Deere tractor 
with mega tires on it and hit the GPS and send it off. And sometimes we don't pay attention because we're so rich, we're so lucky, we've got so much of that topsoil and so much good, arable, productive land and smart people and hardworking people in this country. So we're kind of spoiled, but we've got to take care of this, this little slice of the Earth's surface. And it falls to you guys to do that. That's it. That's all we got.